Mac Power Users, episode 527, Dictation and Text Capture. Hello, everyone. I am David Sparks, and welcome to the Mac Power Users. And as always, we are joined by my fellow co-host, Mr. Stephen Hackett. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm good, David. How are you? Excellent, man. I'm doing great. And uh, this is a show that is right up my alley. We're, we've been wanting to talk about text, or at least I've been wanting to talk about text and dictation for a couple of years now on MPU. We just hadn't got around to it. So today's show is all about how we capture text. And But before we do that, I guess there's a few announcements, aren't there? Yeah, we got a, a couple of things going on. Um, some Some people had asked me to... <laughs> in my life to make sure I mentioned this on the show, but I am doing some 512 pixels merchandise right now. So the day this comes out, there's only a couple of days left to get this. Cause like the t-shirts are unlimited run. So I'd love if you would check those out. Thank you to everyone who did check them out. And uh, I think we are going to do some more MPU merch, maybe later in the year. We have a couple ideas around that, but um, for now, this is what, what I'm doing. It's a, it's a, a joke on Huey Lewis's song. It's hip to be square but it uses the little 512 Mac icon. I thought it was very clever. Can I can I tell you a story, David, about this idea? Please do. Because it is related to our topic. It's not just me talking. All right. Uh, so I had wanted to do another you know piece of merchandise for the blog, and I wasn't really sure what to do. And this idea sort of came to me while I was grocery shopping. You know, some people think in the shower. Some people think when they exercise, and of course I do that too, Yeah. but sometimes I'm just like strolling through Whole Foods and an idea pops in my mind. And so I had my phone with me and I was able to capture that text in Apple Notes. And when I came home a couple of days later, I thought, I still like this idea and I moved forward, but it was text capture in the real world. It was great. Good. See, I would have put it in drafts because then I badge it, drafts badges if I have an unprocessed yeah. item. And that always like pesters me. When I was in uh, back in my jazz days, uh, we used to uh, tour with an orchestra. I was in the honor band, and um, whenever somebody got up and they couldn't swing, you know, they couldn't play jazz. We our secret code was L seven. You know, it's like L seven. What's that director like? He's an L seven. Okay. So put L seven together. L seven. Squ- square. square. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's good. That's a solid burn. It's not hip to be L7, not hip at all. (laughs) Anyway, um, so we are here about text. And before you turn us off, (laughs) let me make the pitch. (laughs) Uh, Text is the starting point for so much of your work. I know that's true for me. I mean, it's not just answering email, but anything you do in terms of writing, capturing thoughts, you need to get text in. And I always feel like there's some kind of barrier in there between the brain and the fingers. And quite often we put off tasks because we just don't want to start writing. It's just such such a hard task to move that cursor from the left to the right. And um, and I feel like quite often the battle is won with the first sentence. You know, if you can just start writing, quite often you can get done writing. But mm-hmm. you've got to start. Um, uh, I was talking to a friend about this recently, and uh, she wants to write a book. And I'm like, that's great. And she's like, I can't get started. And I used uh, my boulder analogy. You know, imagine a hill that is a um, slight incline, you know, maybe an incline of 10 feet, and then it goes downhill for like 100 yards. But you've got to get that boulder up those first 10 feet before you get it rolling downhill. And that's what writing is, in my opinion. I mean, those first, you know, getting started, getting the thing rolling at the beginning is hard work. But once you get going, it just kind of takes you along with it. And so how can we help you as nerds get up those first 10 feet? And uh, that's the goal today. So um, uh, we're going to talk about text capture, not just with writing the keyboard. I want to talk about, you know, what kind of automation can use to get text in automatically. Uh, Voice to text. A long time ago, we did a whole episode on voice to text. We're going to do a a large segment on it today, but the whole show isn't devoted to voice to text. But there's a lot out there now that's worth talking about. And then also I want to talk about some text applications and tools to help make your writing better and easier. So it's all about text today. Everybody needs to do text. Oh, yeah. And I think what you said about getting started, that's so true. I mean, for for me, at least, writing is is a muscle. And if I'm not actively writing something, 
every day, then it's it's something that can fall out of practice and it takes a lot of work to to make it easy and tools are a good thing to look at if you're struggling with it. But I, I think tools aren't the ultimate answer, even though that's what we're going to talk about today. For me, it's I got to write every day or every couple of days or, or it starts to fall apart on me. And what's neat now is that you can have these tools with you everywhere. A lot of the things we're going to talk about are cross platform. So when that idea does come to you in the grocery store, you know, you can pull your shopping cart to the side and and jot something out on your phone or dictate it to your watch and have it captured for later. That's something that, you know, in the past you had to have a notebook and a pen on you at all times, which I do anyways, but a lot of people don't. And it was trying to remember it and then you get home and like type it up. And I love that we just have these tools available to us wherever we are. It makes such a huge difference for me. Yeah, the you know the barriers are down. It's so much easier than it used to be. Um, when I was writing the books for Wiley Press, the um, the iPad at work book and the Mac at work books, um, I wanted to do work on iPad, mm-hmm. but there wasn't really a good solution. So much so that, that I was trying to convince a Scrivener guy to make and make the app that I <laughs> helped him get an iPad. But the um, it, it it really wasn't easy at the time. And now that all those barriers are down, I mean, we're going to talk about a bunch of writing tools today that all sync across multi-platform, you know, and a lot of them use services like Dropbox. So you can go on a Windows PC, then an Android phone, then an iPhone, an iPad, then a Mac, and your words just continue wherever you sit. And that is really powerful. I mean, we're running out of excuses, people. We got to get writing. So there's two things about um, keyboard entry that... I think we want to cover the first is where do you put the text that you write with the keyboard? And the second question is how do you speed it up? So I thought what we'd start with is just talking about, you know, what's the destination for your text. Um, when I was a very young computer nerd, that was always Mac, write Or Microsoft word. I mean, word processing happened in word processors and, mm-hmm. Uh, text editors really weren't a thing at the beginning or to the, you know, nobody really thought of them in the way that we think of them now. And it's interesting because this is something where the evolution of computers has really helped us as writers because text processors are exactly, I'm sorry, word processors are exactly what the name describes It's the thing that processes words. You can add beautiful fonts. You can, change the margins you can do layout you can apply headings and styles but it's not necessarily a great place to get the words out of your brain into the into the keyboard and you know into the file i think for me those tools like something like microsoft word it has a certain formality to it that i that i don't want all the time right not only does it have a lot of features but it's like okay i'm opening a document i'm saving a document where do i save this where a lot of text editors today in sort of our cloud powered world have sort of gone away with the idea of individual documents right you're just creating an apple note or creating uh some text in something like tot which i've just really fallen in love with over the last couple of weeks and it for me it's okay i can just like hit this and i, I know it's saved i don't have to worry about where i'm saving it I don't have to worry about all of those things. There's still a place for Word documents, of course. But for me, it's, like I said, it's a level of formality that I just, I don't need or really care for. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, it depends. There's a lot of people that work in word processors every day because they have to. I I spend more time in Microsoft Word than Pages because the the day job, um, I deal with a lot of lawyers on transactions and Microsoft Word is the is the chosen weapon that we all use to to do this because a lot of the work I do is tracking changes. You know, I I write on the document, I send it to the other lawyer, he writes on it, sends it back, and uh, there's this kind of formality, this process that everybody just uses Word to do that. Yeah. All, all that being said, I don't like writing contracts in Microsoft Word because in addition to the save format, which Stephen talks about, I don't like the the bells and whistles stuff that are, is there. There's just so much going on in that app. When you you look at it, it's just so easy to get distracted. At one point, I used to compare it to like a cockpit of a fighter jet. But <laughs> I, it, it really did. I mean, I just want to write a document, right? And you open it up and there's so many buttons. But 
I think Microsoft over the last probably five years has done a, a better job of kind of like containing that better. Mm -hmm. So now they've got these ribbons and, and they, they've made it so it's not, it's less like a fighter cockpit. Maybe now it's a Cessna, you know? There you go. <laughs> but it, it's, um, but it's not, you know, that's still not good. And like the, the Microsoft Word version, I'm sorry, the iPad version is, is even cleaner, but missing a few tools I need. Uh, but the, uh, so I, I work in them all the time and I understand that, a lot of people do, but I think the argument I would make is don't, unless you need to, like, as an example, I'm in the middle of writing a, a contract right now for a client and I'm doing the whole thing in Ulysses. I've got, you know, it all formatted out and I'm laying the contract out when it's all done. I will export that as text and drop it in Microsoft word. And then I have a word document that has very specific um, formats, style sheets that I've set up. Mm -hmm. And it'll take me all of five minutes to to do the formatting at the, at the very end. But I just don't want that stuff in the way while the stuff I need to focus on are the actual words. Yeah. And I mean, make no doubt, like, I, I still feel like the world goes round because of Microsoft Office. Yeah. It is, it is still completely ubiquitous. I mean, I keep it on my machines for the same reason. We get contracts and things I need to deal with. And it's change tracking is amazing. But. If you don't, I think you said it really well. If you don't necessarily need those features, there are other places you can start that offer less friction and less overhead. Yeah, and I'm not sure I'd agree with you that it's chain tracking is amazing. It's 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 it works. It's you know? it's better than the others I've used at least. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, one of the things they do nice is you can like have a thread inside a change, which is nice. So you can, as we go back and forth, we can have comments back and forth to each other on a specific change, which is. Nice. Um, I think the uh, the layout and pages of of change tracking is is prettier, but I think it's a little more powerful in Word. So, but both of those apps I think are are very mature now and very stable and absolutely usable. I use Pages too. I've got you. Not surprisingly, I've got a bunch of clients that are Mac people and they want Pages documents. Mm -hmm. So I can you know I'm bilingual. You know, <laughs> there's no no problem. Uh, but the um, but I do think that. Uh, you know, for a show today, we're talking about getting text in. I would recommend that if that's the way you're putting text in now, that you consider some of the other options. And and I guess we should talk about that next. You know, what are the other options? Yeah. So you mentioned uh, Ulysses. So let, maybe let's let's start there. It is a very powerful application, but one I think that at least in conjunction with these others we're talking about, I think its real strength is its organiza organizational tools, where you can group documents have folders and I think they call them groups. Um, uh, so walk us through a little bit about why that's your app of choice for some of this work. Yeah. I mean, the Ulysses, the, the comparison point of Ulysses is Scrivener and I have kind of a long history with both apps. I've been a fan of both of them and remain a fan of both of them. Uh, so I think episode like six of Mac power users was a deep dive on Scrivener just to give you an idea. But the, uh, the idea of these apps is, it's a huge bucket of words and you can apply structure and then start filling them in. This was real mind opening for me or eye opening for me. The first time I, I experienced it was, okay, it's an app where you pick kind of, you can do like an outline layout and each one, each entry in the outline, you can then put as many words into that entry as you want and then it assembles them for you. But once you've created it, you can move those buckets of text around to see how the formatting can change. That's a very simple explanation of what you can do with these apps. And as a result, it just gives you a way to really concentrate on the words and how they're formatted and put together. Because I often, with complicated writing projects, will start with a mind map or an outline. It's just such a natural workflow to go from that mind map or outline into this Ulysses or Scrivener format and then as the writer, I don't have to start at the beginning and end at the ending. In fact, as a, an attorney, the legal briefs I write, the very last thing I write in any brief I file is the introduction because I don't feel like I can summarize. That's the point where you're summarizing it for the judge to give him the 30-second version of your argument. And I don't feel like I can do that adequately until I've written the whole thing. So that's something that always gets done last. So I can start in the middle and work my way out. Did the same thing with the books I wrote is I, I don't sit and start the book from page one to page 100. You know, it's not fiction. It's nonfiction. It's 
you know, technical stuff. So I can say today, I feel like writing about print to PDF. So I'll go to that bucket and fill it up with words. And then the next day I can pick a different bucket and I jump around. And then when the buckets are all full, the book is done. And it's just so much better to write that way. Well, it gives you the the freedom to to move about and be able to treat them as as individual things as opposed to a long narrative piece. And depending on the type of writing you're doing, that's pretty perfect. You know, I know. Yeah. I'm sure lots of authors over the years have started at the beginning and at the end, but I don't think that way. And if you're doing technical writing, it's really actually difficult to work that way. Yeah, and. So you li- the difference is between them. They're both solid apps. They both have um, iOS versions and Mac versions. They both sync. You know, they they cover all the basics. Um, but Ulysses is cleaner, is I guess the way to put it. It's very opinionated in terms of the program. And I, I had um, breakfast with the Ulysses team one year at WWDC, and I was talking to them about it. And and they they really have an idea about what they want their app to look like, you know, and so much so that they, I believe they have a custom font that the app uses, it, and it it's very good, you know, the the opinionated design is well executed. They one of the things they can do is they have little icons that can represent your bucket, so you don't have just a bunch of folders in the margin. You can have you know things for them, for instance. Stuff that I want to read, I, I use the eyeglass icon and I put that next to it instead of a folder. So when I'm looking at my Ulysses library, I can see very quickly stuff I need to get to or I need to read. And I was asking about those icons and how come you don't do custom icons? They're like, no, we if you tell us an icon that you want, we can probably put it in. But we want the icons to have a certain look. We don't want people bringing in a bunch of garbage icons, you know. <laughs> you know, and but I mean that was to me very telling and. And as a result, it's a kind of a joy to work in that environment because everything is just clean and you're not in a jet cockpit, you know, you're on a sailboat, you know, you've got a couple lines to pull and then you just got to start, you know, start, start, you know, putting your words in. And, and I find that that is very conducive for me. And I love the way they've implemented the, the iPad app. I don't want to say it's feature for feature, but I know that's their goal. And I think it's probably there now, but basically anything I can do, I I can't think of the last time I was unable to do something on the iPad or Mac versions that didn't work on the other. Um, so they've done a very good job of keeping those things in parity. And it's just, it's just a, a joy to work in it. And in addition, as Stephen was saying, it's a huge library. All you have to do is open another folder or another kind of project from within inside the library. So when I look at my Ulysses library, I've got one folder that contains a bunch of draft contract text that I use. And I've got another folder that's got a bunch of words for the next field guide that I'm writing. And, you know, it's just like I've got another one that's got a bunch of half written blog posts. So I can get to all of my words within this one app very easily. And I don't have to think about it. And when you were working on that, is it primarily at your Mac? Is it split between Mac and the iPad? It's everywhere, man. Everywhere? It's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I can, not only can I do it on my Mac and my iPad, I can also open it on the iPhone and start dictating into it. So it's, you know, any, I have no excuse not to put words in when I'm, when they come to me. And uh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Like we said earlier, that's the beauty of our modern age. Yeah. Um, the other thing, now the other one, Scrivener, because I feel like this conversation has to kind of happen at the same time because these apps are so similar. Scrivener does a lot of the same things. It gives you the buckets. It has some great organization tools. It was created as a tool to write a novel. So it's got a lot of novel tools like um, character development tools in it. And like it's even got like index cards where you can put ideas on index cards and put them on your screen and virtually organize them. It has more bells and whistles. It also has much more control over typography than Ulysses does. And uh, I find it quite useful. One of the things I really like about Scrivener is the research stuff is great because with Scrivener, you can drop all your research in. You know, we were talking about Stephen's library last week, your research library. If you're writing something about, you know, the Lisa the Lisa computer. I have to almost say computer. I'm not sure, but he knows what Lisa is, but <laughs> uh, you could drop all those PDFs out of your Devon library into Scrivener. And like on a 27 inch iMac, you can literally have in one app, all your re- reference materials on the right side of the screen and all your words on the left side of the screen. And I find when I was writing complicated legal briefs, that was super useful. Like I would have a bunch of case law 
rendered in PDF in my Scrivener document. And I would have that on the screen while on the left side, I've got my buckets of words that I'm filling up as I'm writing the brief. And that's super powerful. Yeah, I've talked to people who have used Scrivener for fiction, and they use those research tools to work on character details, right? So if they need to remember how tall a character is or the color of their eyes, they can record all of that off to the side and kind of build a resource library to pull from and to refer to as they write, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, they're both amazing, but they're both different. Yes. And I th- think they both have free trials. So, you know, but even just going to the website, you can look at the screenshots and you're they're you know, even though fundamentally they do a lot of the same things, they have a very different attitude about what they do. I think you could just look at a few screenshots and know which one is for you. It's that, you know. Yeah, I think that's it true. really is. It's really that that clear. Um, but so that's a great place to put your words, you know, an app like that where it organizes for you, keeps them. Both Scrivener and Ulysses are rock solid. The only data loss I've ever had in all these years in either of those apps was um, years and years ago, I tried a cloud service called SugarSync before Dropbox was even Dropbox. And because um, my library for Scrivener was a container sugar sink barfed all over it, but that wasn't, that wasn't Scrivener's fault. You know I mean? And they really have syncing figured out now in a way where you don't have to rely on third-party apps. Uh, same thing Ulysses, when they first switched over to iCloud sync, they had some problems that was iCloud's fault, not theirs, but they've mm-hmm. sorted all that out. I mean, I think you can rely on sync on either one of those apps. I think so too. They're both big time apps though. And I think another place to put your words is something that's not quite so big. And uh, the we had Greg Pierce on the show recently. He's a friend of the show, but he's also an amazing developer. And his application drafts, I think, is an outstanding place to stick your words. Yeah, and and now that there is a, a Mac version out for it, you do have that cross-platform capability. And uh, we've talked about drafts a lot, but the thing that really stands out in my mind is that you can use all those really powerful actions for the step after capture, for what you want to do with the text. And it really makes drafts sort of a scratch pad, but a scratch pad that can extend itself into a bunch of other apps and services, whereas some of these apps, if you wanted to to get that text somewhere else, you may be you know copying and pasting and going back and forth. But drafts' real power, in my mind, is that sharing functionality. Yeah. I mean, just as an example, um, one of the challenges we have with MPU is we get a lot of feedback email. And so we've over the years had different ways we solve this problem. We used to use Evernote. Now we're using a Google Doc. But I wanted to automate the process of putting the feedback into the Google Doc. So I created a Google Doc just called Running Feedback that me and Stephen share. And when someone emails me something I want to add to the feedback, I'll, I just put it in drafts and I have an action in drafts that appends whatever text is in that current draft to the end of a Google, a specific Google doc, which happens to be this feedback doc. And then it puts a couple um, lines underneath it. So as the email comes in that I want to add now, it's just a simple process of copy paste into drafts and execute one action. And I don't have to open up Google docs and do all this other nonsense. So you know, that's the kind of stuff drafts can do for you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Google Docs. Where do you see that fitting into this? Because I know a lot of people, including myself, like our worlds revolve around Google Docs. You know, I'm not a fan of Google Docs as a writing environment. It's, It's a great collaboration environment. And, you know, I'm sure some people will disagree with me, but... The um, in fact, David Wayne was on the show recently talking about how they write scripts collaboratively in Google Docs. But I think... I just don't like the user interface at all. Not one bit. You know, it's not Mac friendly. Sometimes it it acts a little weird for me. I don't like the way, I don't even like the look of it, Um, but it's perfect for collaboration. So quite often I will write something like this outline that we're working on right now. I originally wrote that in drafts and then I just sent it over to um, Google Docs and formatted it. So uh, I will use it as a destination. To me, I'm, I treat it more like a word processor than as a text input device. Hmm. How about you? For me, it, it is critical to how I work because my, most of the documents I'm in on a regular basis are shared with other people, whether it be someone like you that I do a podcast with or stuff that Mike and I share for the company. And so 
for me, like I, I will do long form work in Google Docs in the browser, but it's because it's shared. For things that didn't need that, I would I would use other tools because Google Docs is it's not the best, especially if you're on iOS. It's pretty pretty junky in places, honestly, and that can be really frustrating. And I think its organization can be frustrating, like the Google Drive paradigm just sort of, I think it's confusing to a lot of people. And that sharing, though, is really what brings me back to it, where I can have real time back and forth in a document, you know, as we're going through this this recording, right? We're making little notes, we're changing the order of things all live, and there's really nothing that does that as well as Google Docs. There are other things that that do it, but in my experience, Google Docs is still king of the hill for that. So it's ability to share and to collaborate in real time. That's what makes it so important to me. Yeah, I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far, but I would argue that Quip is equally good to Google Docs. Mm-hmm. But it's just, you know, it's just another platform. I think that one is owned by... Um, Salesforce, I think. Salesforce, yeah, which is weird, but they've left it alone. They've owned it over a year and they haven't screwed it up. So that's that's promising. That's good. <laughs> um, but the uh, but but you know these quick text capture apps like Drafts, I think, are also a great place to put your words. If I'm working on something really long and involved, I just go straight to Ulysses. If I'm working on something short, like if an idea for a blog post comes up to me that isn't going to be something I need to like outline, I'll just write it in Drafts. But there's a competitor to drafts on the market. We talked about it briefly last week, but I thought we should follow up on it. And that's this app, Taut. Um, I've used it a lot more since we recorded last week. And the um, and it's a gorgeous app. And if you just want something that's going to hold six buckets of text, mm-hmm. was it six, right? It, it is uh, seven, actually. Seven. Okay, seven. It's great for that. Um, it doesn't have the actions that drafts does. Right. And critically, what it didn't have, I had something go wrong this week. I I wrote a um, fairly detailed email to a client in in relation to something they asked me to review for them. And it was a long email. And I got it. I sent it, you know, and the next morning, client wrote me and says, hey, I didn't get that email. And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, you know. (laughs) And then I looked in my email box for emails I sent to him, and it wasn't there. And I would have swore I sent it, right? I wrote the email because I've been testing taught. I wrote it in taught. And of course what I did with taught is I've treated different colors for different areas of my life. And as soon as I sent it off, I deleted it from taught and the email was gone. No, no, but I couldn't find where it went. And, um, and it was no longer there. Whereas in, in drafts, I archive everything I write in there. Mm-hmm. So there's like a backup of everything. And in this case, because I I blind copied it to the base camp, I was able to get the text. And I find, ultimately what I the, the mistake I made was somehow I sent the email to myself. Ah, that'll get you. So when I searched for email to the client, it wasn't there. And gotcha. I was, so I, I was able to find it, but it was a near miss of some data loss. Mm-hmm. And and it, that was like enough of like, you know, oh wait a second, I got to back away from the edge here. I I need drafts backup. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Todd so, is very just like text is like a vapor, right? It's there and then you don't need it anymore. And I want to correct something quickly. I said on the feedback show is that I couldn't, I didn't think you could make it come out of the menu bar and you totally can. You just set its preference to have a menu bar app, not doc icon. And then you close the window and then you click on it in the menu bar and it shows up. You can even set a keyboard shortcut. So I have command option T open up uh, tot wherever I am. It's like right now I'm taking little notes for edit points just in tot and it's just there and I can type into it and then I'm going to copy and paste it into the Google doc at the end. So it is not a a solution if you want long-term storage. I mean, it syncs perfectly fine, but like you said, you only have seven buckets. And so right now all I have in there is, like I said, edit notes for this and I'm keeping uh, a little running log of how many 512 shirts I've sold just over time to see how that's progressing. And that's it. I'm only using two of the seven and one of them will go away here in a, in an hour or so. Yeah. But it is also the learning curve is ridiculously um, easy. Mm-hmm. You open it. There's seven circles. You, you click on one. Each one is a different color. So you know where you're at and it, it does what's on the tin. I, I think it's a really well executed and great app, especially for people who don't want the power of drafts, you know? 
So yeah, I, I think that's absolutely a, a, play, a good place to stick text. Uh, I, I always open up a drafts window when someone calls me and I just take notes in relation to my, my day job. So mm -hmm. I'll just like, I run a text expander snippet to get date and time. And then I have another snippet that kind of roughs out a call outline. And then I just type in, as we talk, if I promise to do something, I've got things I do. So I make sure I, I live up to my promises. And then afterwards I save that to the, the base camp for the, the client and it's just having the quick open of text that drafts that makes that possible. But talk could work exactly the same way. You know, if you want to capture text quickly, you need something on your Mac that can open up immediately. And the big advantage of drafts always on iOS has been just that when you open the app, you immediately have a blinking cursor. There's no files open, no directories to navigate and talk works the same way. Yeah. that That's huge for me. It's like, it is available instantly. Cause if you're on that call or, you need to jot, you know, someone is talking to you and you realize you should have been taking notes. It can just start immediately. Yeah. Lesser extent, I would say is Apple notes and bear. Um, okay. It's harder to get to. I mean, you've got to open a file or you've got to find the file you want to add stuff to. Uh, both of them though are very shortcuts friendly. So like you could create a shortcut that could append to an existing note in uh in bear or apple notes i would add ulysses to that list as well ulysses is also very good one of the things ulysses does with shortcuts is it gives you a specific id for each ulysses note you create uh, whereas apple notes makes you search for a note that has the um it's just goofy so uh, I, let me back up and explain a little bit further so with with shortcuts if you want to add text to a note shortcuts needs to know what note you're going to put it in right with Ulysses, it creates a unique identifier for each note. So you get this long string of text that you can put into the shortcut that says, this is the one, and it goes exactly to that one every time. With Apple Notes, they don't give you a unique identifier. Instead, I have to create one. So I just put some some text, some random text at the bottom of a note, and I search for that. That's the only way I can guarantee, because if I like use a client name, I might have seven notes with the client name in it. So it's not going to put the text in the right place. So... Um, that was a really kind of long explanation. Apple notes is okay, but it's not as good at this stuff. I agree with all of that. And I, I think particularly on the Mac, that process, like it creates a new note wherever you are, but then if you have a lot of folders and stuff, like it just gets busy really quickly. And I mean, like I've got almost 400 things in notes. I use it all the time for all sorts of things, but it's not necessarily where I want to go to write something new notes for me is a repository of things that I may need to reference later. Yeah, me too. It's, it's great reference. It's not really a writing environment for me. This episode of Mac power users is brought to you by Sanebox. Go to sanebox.com slash MPU to learn more and you'll receive a $25 credit when you sign up. Sanebox learns what email is important to you and filters out what isn't, saving you hours and hours. It works with a whole bunch of different email programs and services. It goes with you as you go on your email app scavenger hunt. You don't have to use a special app or anything like that, which is great. And this filtering is really powerful. So it looks at your inbox and it, and it, it helps decide what you need to deal with now and what can be dealt with later. And those later things go into a folder called Sane Later. They'll be waiting for you there and you can train it over time. If you say, Hey, I don't want this there or always want this there. It has those tools. But my favorite thing is the same black hole. You get an email from somebody. This happened to me recently where I bought something online. I didn't realize I was being signed up to an email list. They started emailing me a bunch. I go hit the unsubscribe button and it says, Hey, it's going to take us 14 days to unsubscribe you. In the meantime, I'm getting an email or two a day. And so what I just grabbed those messages. I put them in the same black hole and now those marketing emails never come across my path. They're just gone forever. Samebox also includes snooze and reminder features so you can save an email for later. I do a lot of that uh, over the weekend, things I want to make sure I see during the, the week. You know, hey, it's Saturday. I don't want to deal with this now. I'm going to deal with it Monday. I can snooze it till Monday, and it pops back up when I'm ready to go back to work. It's really fantastic. Various pricing plans are available. They start as low as about $4 a month. There is a 14-day free trial, so you can check it out. You can see how it works and see what a big difference it will make in your email life. 
66% of MPU listeners who have tried SaneBox end up subscribing, so I bet you're going to love it. That's SaneBox.com slash MPU, the free trial and a $25 credit towards any plan. Our thanks to SaneBox for the support of the show. Okay, so uh, we've talked about places to put text. Let's talk about improving text entry and speeding things up. Um, dictation is an obvious thing, but we're going to give that a whole segment later because uh, there's a lot to say. But I wanted to talk about just general text automation tools, and I think there's a lot of, of places to go with this. And I would start out with the idea of template documents. I mean, uh, people don't think about it, but if you're, let's say you're in sales and you have to make a proposal, one of the best things you can do to speed up text input is just to create a template sales presentation where you just open up that template every time and start there. It can be a huge lifesaver. I know at Relay, we use this for all of our contracts. So we have our our template, we make a copy of it, we edit that copy. And it means that if we make a change, we make it to the template and we know that everything moving forward will have that change, which is a huge, a huge way to save a bunch of time. Where if you're starting these from scratch every time, you're probably going to have errors. You're going to have things that you meant to change that one time and then you forgot the three times after that. It gets really messy really quickly. And so I really like having a templates for things that I use uh, often. So a couple power tips here. If you're going to be doing a template and using it frequently, uh, there are going to be things that change in your template. And to the extent you can figure those out, you can even further automate it. And the most basic way to do this is just using wild cards or if you want to be fancy, call them variables. So let's say that you've got a template letter and it says dear and you want to put the person's name in it. You could type, um, the, this is the way I do it. I create a variable. So I'd say dear and then I would put name next to it. But I would put two asterisks on either side of the name. And you can use whatever symbol you want. I mean, one of the problems is the ones I use conflict with the uh, markdown Code, yeah, but it doesn't but it doesn't matter because I don't care. Uh, and then I um and then what I do is once I create a a variable like that, I also paste it at the very top of the text document. So you'll have at the top there'll be one that says name with two asterisks on either side. Then maybe there'll be something that says date that has two asterisks and just whatever variables you have sprinkled throughout the document. But then when you open the text, you can see, oh, I've got like five variables in this document. I'll have to search the document for them. And then I can just do a search and replace for each one of those and very quickly turn the template into something that I can work with. There will be things like I occasionally have things I work on that I can't make a simple variable out of. It's something that I need to like address specifically. So maybe I'll say, write a paragraph about whatever, you mm-hmm. know, and, and I'll put that b- between two asterisks and put that at the top of the document. So then when I need to go assemble the document, I can go through and just type that one paragraph in. Um, but you know, that's a very basic way to do text automation. Got it. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, I think I, that bell's going to ring a lot today. I think so. I'm going to move it closer. Uh, so I <laughs> use capital T capital K when journalism school worked at the newspaper, Capital TK is a very common placeholder in publishing. It actually yeah. stands for to come, even though C starts yeah. with the come starts with a C, but K. Yeah. Anyways, the reason it was chosen is because very few words in English have that letter combination. So yeah. I can search TK in pages wherever I'm working, and I can be confident that the, the, re, the results I'm going to get back are placeholder items. There's lots of ways to do this, and it, it really can be – helpful because if you just leave blank spaces so it's dear in the blank space you're going to miss it and then someone's going to get a weird email from you it's like dear space comma like what did you not put my name in right like those things matter and so having a system that is consistent across the applications and documents you're working in can save you those little embarrassing paper cuts and i so if i was doing it steven's way i would put the tk at the front and the back of the variable name Mm -hmm. because i like to be able to search and not only just see something to come, but actually what is it that's going to go here? And, you know, search and replace is so fast and easy on both pages and word and all of these document editors we've talked about that it can be a very easy way to, to put them in. Hmm. There's something you can do if you want to go further with document templating. I covered this in the um, keyboard maestro field guide, 
And um, it's too much to talk about here, but I created a script that opens up like a Word or Pages document, and then it applies the template, and it goes, and it gives you a menu, and you just type in the stuff, and it goes and searches and replaces. But it can do it to multiple documents, so you can run it on seven documents. And it, so you can go really far down the, the template rabbit hole if you want. But I just thought we should at least mention that one of the easiest ways to automate text is to already have it written. One thing I do want to say, just because you mentioned it, you mentioned Markdown. We're not really going to get into that today, but I would say if that's something that uh, that you are interested in hearing from us about, let us know in the forums if that would be a, an interesting topic at some point in the future, because it is a really clever, powerful formatting tool for plain text. And I could talk all day about it, but if it's something that y'all are interested in, let us know. Yeah. In addition to automation with templates, also there's, you know, everybody's best friend, copy and paste. We talked earlier about how both of us use Apple Notes as reference information. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with having reference information in there that is uh, that we can copy and paste out. Um, I don't use this as much as I used to because a lot. whenever I find myself doing that, I usually turn it into a text expander snippet. Um, I just find that faster for me. But it, it's a great way to put stuff in. Uh, however, I often find myself copying and pasting from the web. Like I was just working on a legal thing the other day and I had to get a quote from a judge out of a case. And, you know, I got my web browser open to the case. I can copy and paste and stick it in. Um, but this is where copy and paste can, can break. Uh, when you, especially when you take stuff off the web is you've got to do a paste and match style. If that's something you're not aware of, we should probably talk about it. Yeah. So in that scenario, you copy something from the website, you paste it in your document, the font doesn't match. The spacing's all weird, right? Maybe it's like even a different color. Maybe it even brought background color with it. I've seen that before. Uh, it's amazing what the web can do to a document. <laughs> yeah. It's, it can really destroy it. And this a copy and, and paste with match style basically just copy, just paste the content. So just the words and it matches the formatting to whoever you're pasting it into. And it is just a huge lifesaver if you're, if you're copying stuff, even across documents, right? Even from one page's document to another, and you just want the font to match without having to deal with it. You can do that uh, paste and match style from the edit menu and it will just look as if it was always there. Yeah, and to do that, uh, what is it? Shift, uh, Option, Command, V, I believe. I have to look at my fingers. <laughs> yeah. So that that's usually what it is. Uh, you can customize it if you want, but the um, in all of your word processors or text editors, make sure you understand how to do that because it will save you a ton of time. Mm -hmm. So let's go further down the stack. Um, uh, We've talked about template documents. We've talked about template text that you get out of things like notes. Let's talk about text replacement. And okay. to start start off, I would just say uh, Mac OS and iOS both have powerful text replacement built in uh, to the operating systems where you can type things like, um, you know, your cell phone number or commonly misspelled words. And whenever you type them, it'll replace them for you. Um, I think those are are solid now for the longest time they were really terrible because they wouldn't sync. Mm -hmm. But, uh, as of, I think the last couple of years, it's been much more stable. And when you type in a text replacement, it will, it'll work across. What's helpful about that on iOS in particular is that it works with the system keyboard. So you don't have to switch to a third party keyboard. Like the one text expander uses, it will just expand wherever you are. Yeah. Um, so that is absolutely something that you should use for um, quicking up your or picking up your your text entry. Um, but then you mentioned text expander. I think they kind of come into the conversation too. It's always hard to talk about text expander in the editorial content of the show because we they've been they were the original sponsor of our show. We talk about them often as sponsors, but I feel like they're going to get ripped off if we don't mention them because it's an app that I use for for text expansion. And so I guess full disclosure, I they sponsor the show. I pay for two accounts, one for me and one for my assistant. I believe, Stephen, you pay for yours as well. Mm -hmm. I do. And I just find the app really useful. And where Text Expander for me um, gets beyond the stuff that I can do with the simple text replacement is a lot of the the text replacements, if I want to go further down the stack, like it uses Apple Script. So I've got one where when I send an email, it writes the subject line. 
then it hits the tab key, which you can't do with the basic one, the, the Mac one, or the Apple built-in text replacement. And then it, it uses an Apple script to insert the person's name. So it can say, hi, Steven, comma. I don't have to type that. And then I can even do fill-ins. So just as an example, this morning, my daughter wasn't able to go to school. Uh, she's a senior, Steven. Ooh. I'm not sure she was that sick, honestly. <laughs> I hope her school will be. But anyway, she did go late. So I've got two text expansions. One is is late and one is sick. And I just run it in an email and it creates the note to the uh, to the admissions office saying that she's not going to be there. She's going to be late. So so um, that's an example of a text expander snippet. But it does the whole thing for me. It does a subject line, hits the tab key, puts the entry in. I type in a fill in what time she's going to be there and it does the rest for me. And I really like that. Um, uh, another example is um, when I form a company for a client, there's a specific email I have to send to my vendor in Sacramento that gets the right paperwork in the Secretary of State. But I, I caught myself writing that email out two or three times. I'm like, oh, this is not right. So I, I text expander automated it. So there's just a bunch of stuff I can do with text expander that goes kind of far beyond what I do, I, I find the, the built in text expansion stuff great for something like a cell phone number or a misspelled word. But uh, if you really want to get serious about having your computer write a lot of text for you, you need something more powerful. Yeah, I've used it forever. My first time with it was as a Mac Genius at the Genius Bar. We used it so we could have our case notes follow a certain style. Yeah. And yeah. you could go in and just very quickly insert what you needed. For me, one of the the most powerful things in it is the ability to handle date and time stuff. And if you're just taking notes, that can be a very helpful thing. And you can even have it like move the cursor around and do all all these sorts of little bits of automation, you know, that are simple, but can really speed up something that you're doing over and over. Yeah. As an example, uh, earlier in the show, I mentioned that I take a like a call record when when I do a call related to a client thing. And so I just type call record with no space between it. And I uh, it, it puts in the current date and time with a timestamp. Then it hits a carriage return and it says, you know, on call colon. And I just type in whoever was on it. And then and then I put in, uh, there's another line where it says items discussed. And at the bottom it says action items. And so as I'm on the call, I can fill in who I'm talking to. I can fill in what we're talking about. And at the end of the call, I always write down, what I agree to do or who's and the action items cannot just be for me. It might be for the other person. And then I, I save that and I've got a record of that conversation. And I also have kind of a starting point to add some things to text expander if I want. So um, I'm sorry to OmniFocus if I want. So I can uh, very quickly kind of process the call and I've been doing that for years and it's just a great thing. But the text expander snippet is the starting point because I don't want to be fiddling around with writing down the date and time or stuff that I'm going to write every time uh, when I'm on the call. I'd rather have the app do it for me. Okay. Uh, after text expander, I think the next step up with automation is keyboard maestro. Um, it does so much to uh, automate your Mac. And of course it also does some crazy powerful text stuff too. Go check out MPU 484. We did a whole bunch on Keyboard Maestro there. But where its power really lies is how you can combine multiple things and end up with with text, right? So you can have triggers at a certain time of day if you want to journal every day. Hey, these are the questions I want to be asked every day at 5. And you type them in and save them somewhere. It, it can do so many things. And I think most people don't necessarily think about keyboard maestro in that way but it too has a whole text snippet replacement type tool within it very very powerful yeah and then i think the last one i'd mentioned on text automation is drafts Mm -hmm. um, because it really wears both hats it's a great place to capture text it's also a great place to automate it and it is just crazy all the stuff you can do with it we just had greg pierce on the show so we i think we've covered drafts pretty thoroughly recently on the show but if you haven't played with it, you should check it out because if you're interested in, in automation and particularly on iOS, I think drafts is one of the best tools out there. Totally. Okay. Um, well, you know, we haven't even got to dictation. We're pretty far in, <laughs> but we have a lot more to cover. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Kensington, the professional's choice. Find the right docking solutions for your organization today. Go to kensington.com slash Mac.
So Kensington are the people who make universal docking stations. You know that thing, you put it on your desk, and when you bring your laptop, you just plug in one cable, and it connects you to everything. Well, that's what Kensington does, and theirs are specifically made to increase your productivity. It's so easy to use, you can get access to more ports and make your MacBook, Chromebook, or other laptop as powerful as a desktop. It plugs and plays with no drivers, so you can enjoy up to dual 4K displays with HDMI and DisplayLink video connectors. Plus, there's USB 3.0, USB-C, Thunderbolt 3 with power delivery available. Kensington Engineering Team has three decades of experience in high-volume manufacturing of hardware IT products, and it shows. They have rigorous test cycles and quality control. That means all of their products are tested above industry standards. If you're an IT decision maker looking to find the right docking solution for your organization, check Kensington's Pro Concierge Program and test drive a docking solution today. These guys are serious about making docking stations. There's a lot of stuff out there that's not serious. Kensington is. They're good. They work. Check them out. Go to kensington.com slash Mac right now and check out Kensington. That's kensington.com slash Mac, M-A-C, to learn more. And our thanks to Kensington for their support of the Mac power users and all of Relay FM. So I know you are a huge dictation user and you've been through a bunch of tools over the years on Apple's various platforms. Could you give yeah. us a, a brief rundown of, of some of those tools you've used over the years and how that history goes? You know, I started dictating on uh, the on the PC because when I first started practicing law, Mac was not an option in the office. And so I started using Dragon when it was something where you had to put a space between every word when you dictated. But I mean, lawyers obviously see the benefit of talking and getting words and text captures a big deal to us. And um, so I was always a fan of Dragon. It got much better as they got that naturally speaking engine. But uh, the Mac is all, was a wasteland for the longest time. It's like nobody was working on dictation on the Mac. And there was an app called Mac Speech Dictate. I think this is actually even before you and I met. But I remember the year at Mac World that Mac Speech Dictate announced that they had licensed the Dragon Engine. And it was like all of us were super happy, you know, and um, because we all knew Dragon had a great engine. And now we had the Mac Speech uh, a software running that engine uh, and it immediately got way better. And uh, so I, I use that uh, very enthusiastically. Uh, like a year or two after Mac Speech started licensing the engine, Dragon just bought Mac Speech and they brought Dragon to the Mac. And that was the thing we had for a long time. And it had the same engine as the PC version. It always felt to me like it lagged a little bit behind the PC version. Obviously, Nuance was spending more engineering resources on the PC version than the Mac version. It's a bigger market and more established. I get it. But it was great because it still worked. Um, then things got weird, right? <laughs> uh, so we thought we had dictation all figured out on the Mac. And uh, last year, Nuance announced, hey, we're not supporting the Mac anymore. And as someone who's involved with this stuff, and I talked to a few people that know things, and I started researching things. And it, what I was able to find out is a couple of things. Number one, Nuance is based in Boston. And Apple also has an office in Boston. And I wasn't able to get confirmation of this from anyone, but uh, reading a couple articles that looks like Apple has been doing a lot of their voice to text um, engine work in Boston now. Like they have a big part of the uh, the work that's done on the Siri, you know, voice recognition is coming out of Boston. Okay. And it seems that Apple might have been hiring a lot of people from Nuance. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I, if this is true, and honestly, I don't know that this is all true. So take it. We try not to do a lot of speculation on the show, but take this for what it is. But if I was Apple and I wanted to get much better voice to text dictation and I knew that Nuance was the best at it and I didn't want to hire people and make a move to Cupertino, that's actually not a bad idea to set up a business in Boston, right? So anyway, so so that's one explanation why Nuance is no longer interested in Apple. And then last June, of course, we got voice control announced, which is a new accessibility feature that is shockingly close to exactly what Dragon Dictate does on the Mac, but it's free and it comes on every Mac. So I, I feel like they probably felt like it wasn't worth their money anymore, and maybe they're a little peeved as well. I don't know. Yeah, I could see that. 
so now app we don't have dragon but we do have apple voice control there's a couple things that you know i kind of want to talk through with that as we kind of get through there's comparisons on them and then at the same time that all this was going down of course apple already did have siri text uh, voice to text on the mac and also on ios uh, but it was kind of a more limited version. It wasn't anything nearly the power of Dragon. Like, for instance, on iOS, there was a timer, so it would only go for so long, and then it would stop right. dictating. You. But with voice control, Apple is kind of really up their game. And then the question I'd like to address today is, how far are they, and you know, where do they compare to Dragon at this point? Okay. So let's start with the Mac. Um, first of all, Dragon is not off the table. I, I wrote that I was certain it would stop working with Catalina. It felt to me kind of like a grudge, uh, you know, cancellation, you know, the way they did it with kind of no warning. I felt like they are not going to lift a finger to make sure this works in Catalina. And shockingly, Dragon works fine in Catalina. I have, you know, a copy I bought before uh, I moved to Catalina, and it still works after Catalina. I've talked to a couple of the listeners that do the same thing. But you can't buy it anymore, so... If you have it, go ahead and keep using it. It still works. Um, so then the next question is, well, what about Apple's speech to text? Kind of, I would call Siri dictation on the Mac. So this has been in here for a few years ago. It's very accessible. If you go into your control panel, you can turn it on. I uh, believe it's under the keyboard uh, control panel. If memory serves. Yeah. And uh, and when you do that, when you go in there um, to turn it on, there is a download. And I strongly recommend you do the download. Let me, uh, I got too much going on here. It's the dictation tab of the keyboard. And if you click on it, I've already clicked on it, so I don't see the, the option anymore, but you can download a library. I think it's about a gigabyte size um, file, if memory serves. And it drastically improves the, dictation you can also from there control what microphone it uses like for instance i have my podcast microphone but i actually do the dictation through the imac pro microphone because those microphones are good enough for dictation so you can you can use that and the way that works is there's some trigger key i believe the default is the uh, function key yeah twice you, you double type it pretty quickly and then you get the, the little pop-up saying it's ready for dictation yeah, I, I switch that to the right command key, the key to the right of the space bar. Okay. And the nice thing on the Mac is this dictation is, is pretty good. There's a trigger. It works anywhere on your Mac. So I can be in any, I can be in Microsoft Word. I can be in, you know, Ulysses. I can be in email and uh, Apple Mail and it'll just work. Uh, although for some reason it does, it has never worked for me in comments in Microsoft Word. I don't know what the heck's going on there. <laughs> um, something in Microsoft Word just doesn't take that input. But the, um, uh, the uh, so you can, you, but you can largely run it anywhere. There is no timer, so you can talk unlimited time. Uh, there is no custom dictionary, which is a problem. And I can talk about that in a second. But, uh, you know, so you if you have any particular names or odd, like a name of an app or something, it's probably gonna gonna crash on that. Crash is the wrong word, Stephen. It's probably going to get that wrong. It's going to trip trip over that, definitely. Yeah, exactly. But it's everywhere. It's on your Mac. If you download the file, everybody can start using it today. And I think it's actually quite useful. I use it all the time. You're definitely a bigger dictation person than I am. I don't, I don't hardly ever use it. And I tried in the week before this episode to use it more and more. And I, I just found it. I found it sort of frustrating and, and slower than it would be if I just typed it. So it's not for me. And you, you spoke a little bit about, you know, attorneys use it, a lot of people use it, but what, what really makes this tick for you? Just quick text capture. You know, it's just, it just gets the lousy first draft in, you know, I do a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I've been saying for so long as an attorney, like when I'm working on contract text that I just know in my head what I need to say. And I can get it in faster. It, if the dictation is working right, it spells better than I do because mm -hmm. it always spells the words right. And it's just a great way to get in. Now, it's not something you can rely on. I, I never just dictate and then hit send. But it's it's just a, a great way to sit back and work. Um, a couple ways I use this stuff. And um, like, for instance, I do a lot of my node outlines for more complicated things. 
And when I get done with the mind node, I will open Ulysses or my text editor of choice and just hit the dictation button and just look at the mind node and start dictating the thing. And sometimes I'll back myself into a corner and I'm going to talk later about some power tips for dictation, but then you just say carriage return or new line and you start over again and it's fine. You can always go back and fix that in the edit. Um, so I just find it very quick to go through, but it, later in the show, I have some, some specific workflows where I can show okay. how I think this stuff really helps me out. But either way, I mean, if you don't want to screw around with voice control and you don't have dragon, I think the Apple speech to text is something that continues to get better. Um, and you know, this is one of the parts of Siri that, is kind of unsung. You don't hear about it much. It's a, definitely something that Apple is continuing to work on. And the stuff I'm doing with it now was stuff I was unable to do with Dragon five years ago. You know, so it's, it can, you know, all this stuff just continues to get better. I feel like we're on a curve here where talking to your computer and making text go in is becoming very practical for a lot of people. Then there's the Apple voice control. And that's the thing that showed up with uh, Catalina and iOS 13, I um, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I was hoping it would be an absolute replacement for Dragon. It's really not. Um, it's part of an accessibility feature, and it's definitely made more as an accessibility feature than as a Dragon replacement. Uh, so if you are unable to use your hands, you can control your Mac with Apple Voice Control. And, and Dragon had features like this too, which I, but I, I've never really been a big user of that stuff. Like it can put a grid on the screen so you can drill down with your voice to click the mouse on a certain part of the screen. It's, it's super impressive. Um, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough. I don't need that. You know, what I just want to do is use it to get a lot of text in really quickly. It's definitely more powerful than Apple's text to speech It has a custom dictionary though. It doesn't sync. I don't understand how the company that has iCloud could set this up and they just never connected the sync. Like when I type in a custom dictionary term on my Mac, it doesn't show up on the custom dictionary on my iPad. And so I've got two different, you know, dueling custom dictionaries. I don't like that. You can do corrections though. You can go back and correct words, uh, which you could never do with Apple voice control. Uh, there's no timer and it, it does a good job. I mean, uh, I do think running it feels kind of tedious. It puts an icon, like a big icon on your desktop that you really can't do anything about. Whereas like Dragon, you can remove that and just keep it in the menu bar. It feels just like a little too much. The um, You can turn it off and on with your voice. The command is wake up and go to sleep. Um, and, uh, you know, it's cl it's close to Dragon, but it's not Dragon. I want to be really clear about the difference between these two things. The The previous just dictation feature sort of branded as part of Siri. That, that is you talking into a document or an application somewhere. You were just inputting text yeah. with your voice. Where this new voice control system in Catalina and iOS 13, it is a full control system for your device. So you can go and select menus and edit photos and do all sorts of things with just your voice. It has a dictation aspect to it, of course, but it's also a lot more. Yeah, and... And I am not a power user of those additional functions. I'm using it as a dictation tool. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's really what I'm doing. I'm not controlling my Mac with it. I'll use the mouse or the keyboard. Um, but the uh, it's it's still not quite there, honestly. I I still find myself booting up Dragon sometimes when I need to like really get rolling on this stuff. Wow. And I assume it's something that will get better over time. Apple generally makes a, a pretty big deal of these these features for accessibility purposes. It has got better over time. I mean, you know, it, it's not that far behind dragon, but it's, it's made, I really feel like it's made to do way more than dragon ever intended to do. And as a result, I think a lot of the development cycles are going to that other stuff, which honestly is more important. I mean, there are people using their Macs that don't have use of their hands. They should be able to use their Mac better than me sitting here dictating. Mm -hmm. I totally get that. But um, but I also would like to see the um, the voice control improve. And and I, I was reading an article. I couldn't find it as I was prepping for the show. But I read an article written by somebody at Apple 
that was talking about this in terms of accessibility. And she was saying the point that, you know, you know, rising tide raises all boats. I forget what's the saying. Do you know that saying? Um, something along those lines that, you know, the more they do on accessibility, the better dictation gets for everybody mm. is what she was saying. And sure. I, be- I believe that she's right. And I believe Apple is fully committed to this. And I'm not that worried that dragon is going to stop working at some point, And it definitely will, you know, but the, uh, I think I'll be fine. Like for instance, I have this laptop now and the, I didn't buy dragon for that laptop. I didn't have the laptop when dragon was for sale. And I've been using voice dictation ex- exclusively on that. And I'm getting by just fine with it. You know, it's okay. But but Dragon is still better in some ways. I do think it's cool, though, that Apple is just baking this into the system so you're not reliant yeah. on a third party, especially one – I mean, like we just talked about that it has waning support for the, the platform. Oh, yeah. I have so much more to say about Dragon. Oh, I know. <laughs> on iOS. <laughs> uh, I know. <laughs> This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by our friends over at Squarespace. Make your next move with Squarespace. It lets you easily create a website for your next idea. You get a unique domain name, choice of a bunch of award-winning templates, and much more. Websites have a lot of moving parts. You may need an online store or a portfolio or a blog or a podcast or a gallery of images. You want to host a bunch of videos. Whatever you're looking to do, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that means there's nothing to install, there are no patches to worry about, no upgrades are needed. Squarespace has got all of that covered. You just don't have to worry about it. They have award-winning 24-7 customer support if you need any help. That lets you quickly and easily grab a unique domain name, and all of those award-winning templates are beautifully designed for you to show off your great ideas. We had my brother on the show a few months ago, and we just launched the new version of the Operation Brooklyn Silence website, Built on Squarespace. He and I did it together. It looks really awesome. We're really proud of it. And Squarespace makes it really easy so he and his staff can go in and update content without uh, my help. It's fantastic. Squarespace plans start at just $12 a month, but you can start a trial with no credit card required by going to squarespace.com slash MPU. When you decide to sign up, use the offer code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name and to show your support for the show. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU and the code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase. We thank Squarespace for the support of the show and all of Relay FM. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. All right, so let's talk about uh, voice-to-text dictation on iOS. Okay. And I think the starting point there is Siri dictation, and that's been in the system for a long time now. There's a little microphone button on your keyboard. You tap that, you start talking, and it types in wherever the cursor is. I was so happy when they added that. And I think overall, it's pretty good. I mean, you can use it anywhere on your iPhone or iPad. A great uh, use for that, by the way, is text messages. So great, you know. And the accuracy is only improved over time. Uh, the problem with it is, number one, no custom dictionary again. I mean, like, they have a custom dictionary and voice control. Why doesn't Siri? I just don't get it, man. I just I, don't get it. I don't know why that line is drawn where it is. I really or don't. Or even just like the machine learning. I shouldn't even have to have a custom dictionary. Like as soon as I type something in, machine learning should say, "Oh, that's something he may want to dictate one day." You know, mm-hmm. just ah. Anyway, yeah, but even more vexing is the timer. Oh, I hate the timer so much, Stephen. So I haven't run it recently. I think it's sixty seconds now. It's gone up over the years. At one point, it was forty-five seconds, but. So there's enough time when you hit the button to record two or three sentences. And that's great. But occasionally, I don't realize how much I'm going to dictate. I'll start like to reply to something. And I realize it's more than I thought it was. Just happened to me just the other day. And I was on a roll replying to kind of a complicated email with the the Siri voice to text on my phone. And then, of course, it just stopped, you know, and that's on me, man. I didn't, I didn't see it coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, the, the way around it is internally, you, it's like there's a fuse lit every time you press that little microphone and in 45 to 60 seconds, the bomb is going to go off and it's going to stop dictating. So you have to like know when to stop. It's like, okay, I got two sentences. Can I go for three? Yeah, I got three. I got a fourth one in me. Can I do it? Can I do it? No, I can't, you know? And then the the problem is if you don't catch it in time, you know, you, if you stop and then hit the button again, 
then you're fine. But if it stops mid sentence and you hit the button again, it's dumb and it's going to think you just started a new sentence and it's going to put a period or it's going to capitalize. It's going to, you have to go in and edit the text later because of the interruption in the voice to text. I mean, who wants to deal with this stuff, Steven? I don't get it. Oh, it's, it is really frustrating. I remember when this first came out, I think it came on the iPad first and I use dictation a, a lot more on iOS and the Mac. And I remember even then you hit that timer I thought, oh, in the future, this won't be a problem. I can just go forever. And it is longer, but you really have to learn what it is and keep an eye on it, or you're just talking to nothing for a while, which is really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is super crazy. And then, uh, but it, it's useful within that limited parameter. But I mean, it's so great having the microphone button on the keyboard. If they would just add the custom dictionary and take out the timer, it would solve so many problems. Anyway, uh, so how do I use it with these limitations? Text messages, almost all text messages I reply to are by voice. I'm just, I've just never been good at thumb typing on an iPhone. I can talk much faster and get the reply out. And I've been dictating long enough that my error rate's pretty low because I put on my fancy voice when I dictate, period. <laughs> you know? um, so... It works just fine. The uh, quick draft entries is another one. Drafts, I don't know. I didn't ask Greg about this when he's on the show. I don't I don't think we talked about it, but he has a thing in there where it loops the dictation. Somehow it gets around the error, and I'm terrified Apple's going to realize it one day and yank it out of his app. So I try not to talk about it. If you're from Apple, <laughs> you didn't hear that. La, 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 la. That's, that's not the dictation feature you're looking for. Perfect. Move along. Um, but the uh, but So anyway, it does that, which is great. And just like, for example, recently I was um, going through my email and I'm sure you get this too, because you've got a website. People send you these emails saying, we would like to do a strategic partnership with your website, mm-hmm. or we want to pay you to put a link on your website. And I hate those emails. And so I, I thought, well, I should just put something on my contact page that says I don't do that. So I opened drafts, dictated a sentence that was something I wanted to add to the website. and then. I moved along with my day. And then, of course, when I look at the badge on drafts, it says you've got a, a piece of text in there you haven't processed yet. Then I, the next time I was at my computer, I moved that text onto the website. And that was that. So it, it's good for that kind of stuff. It's not good for the kind of stuff I do, you know, for real with dictation because the timer is, you know, ruins it. And then there's the sordid tale of dragon anywhere. Um, If you listen to old episodes of Mac Power Users, I would be singing the praise of Dragon Anywhere. It was Dragon uh, applying its engine with a cloud uh, component to the iPhone and iPad. And it was the same Dragon engine we were getting on the Mac uh, with the back end happening at Dragon, I believe. But it was very fast and very powerful. And I could dictate just about anything. It had no timer and a custom dictionary. And for a short period of time, I was super happy with that app the highest subscription i've ever paid i paid 15 dollars a month to have that yeah you know it's funny you say that i was at a um, legal conference and i had recommended the app to a bunch of lawyers and some guy like really got on my case about how much it cost Mm -hmm. and the guy was wearing like a thousand dollar suit you know very very fancy i think you know fancy lawyer and i asked the guy how much he bills per hour and it's like 400 bucks an hour i'm like you realize this is like you charge $400 an hour and this is $15 a month. Right. <laughs> and it makes you faster. I mean, I don't know, buddy. I could understand if you were a student, but I don't get it. But anyway, uh, so it was great until it wasn't great. I mean, it was always terrible in terms of like subscribing and getting on their website to like manage your subscription. They never really got that figured out. But what, what really went bad is it just stopped working, you know, and it, like it worked on one iPad, but it wouldn't work on the other iPad. And I mean, they, I think it was when the iPads Pro came out that it stopped working on the Pros, but it would work on the old ones and nobody ever explained why. And they just <laughs> got like, I haven't looked recently, but man, the reviews, I've never seen an app just get torched in reviews so hard for so long. And like, it went on for like a year and there was no word from them. And I just gave up on the app. I obviously unsubscribed, but the um, man, it could have been something. (laughs) 
<laughs> so uh, so then we have the uh, the other thing we have is the Apple Transcription API, which Apple added to the iOS operating system. And there's some apps that have really dug in on that. And uh, the I think the biggest example is an app called Just Press Record, where you can record something and it will transcribe it to text for you. That is shockingly good. Uh, I the first time I used it, I expected it to be complete garbage. And if you're careful with the way you transcribe, the way you speak, it does a good job. And we talked about this on the day one episode of MPU we did last year. But the day one transcription uses the same engine, and I find that really good too. And I sometimes I'll open day one and do like a captain's log entry, like John Luke Picard, and it transcribes for me just fine. And it feels that's pretty great for um, getting texting pretty quickly. Uh, and then, then there's one more app I'd mention on this is called ADA Dictation. I think it's a ten dollar a year subscription, and it does it as well. And it uses, I believe, the Apple API. I tried it. I'm not sure it's any better than Just Press Record, so I'm not sure if it's worth the money or not. And um, but that's one I think that that a lot of people like. But uh, you know, it's okay, but it also doesn't. You know, it's not really voice to text dictation. It's more transcription. So I'm not sure how much people are going to really use it. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me that there that Apple has so many different ways into this. Like, why is the API and the little keyboard, microphone, button, and voice control like? Why don't they all do the same thing? I don't I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. And then on iOS, there's voice control, and I feel like. That's a much bigger deal on iOS and iPad than Mac because on Mac we already had Dragon, and on iOS we haven't had Squat for a long time. That that really gives you what you need: a custom dictionary, no timer, and real deal dictation. So while I'm not super excited about voice dictation on the Mac, um, I'm much more excited about it on my iPad than I am and iPhone than I am on the Mac because it just brought us a bunch of tools we didn't have before. So once you enable it, so and the way voice control works, it's an accessibility feature. So you go into the accessibility pane of the control center on your on your um, on your on your uh, iPhone or iPad, and you enable it. And what I do is you can customize that accessibility button in the control center that you pull down from the top right of your phone or your iPad. So I have it on that accessibility button, so I can turn it off on offer on with that. And then once it's on, you'll see a little blue icon with a microphone in your in the top bar of your iPhone or your iPad, and you can wake it up or put it to sleep with the commands wake up or go to sleep. I don't think you want to leave it on all times. Uh, I mean, and just like on the Mac, you can absolutely control your device. You can put grids on. Once again, this is a thing where if you don't have use of your hands, you can entirely control the device with this accessibility feature. But in terms of dictation, in terms of quick capture text, it is far superior to the built-in Siri dictation because of the lack of that timer. Do you think ultimately Apple will kind of put all this under one heading, like one big feature? Yeah, I sure hope so. I mean, one of the things I thought about when I was working on this show was I feel like what they're going for for voice control isn't really the ultimate dictation tool. You know, they're going for something much more difficult, frankly. They're looking for a way for people who can't use their hands to be able to use all of their technology. And that I think is the priority, as I said earlier, but I do think there is space for them to say, well, let's also just take on dictation for people that just want to dictate better. And I know that's a feature they want. Um, so, you know, ideally if they were to take Siri dictation and just use the same voice uh, to text engine that they're using everywhere else, add a custom dictionary and turn off that darn timer, the voice control would be less appealing to me, you know, because I would rather have it where I can just turn it on by tapping a button on the keyboard and go to town. Um, so th there's definitely room for something in the middle of those two products or just lift Siri dictation to such an extent that it's just more powerful. Right. Where the, the differences don't really count for anything. So I was thinking about, so how do I use all this stuff? You asked that earlier. Um, some of the most common ways I do it, and I've talked about a few of these in the past, but PDF review is something I do all the time. People send me PDFs to, to review and analyze. So one of my favorite workflows with an iPad is 
put a PDF app on two thirds of the screen and then a text edit app on the one third right of the screen and mm -hmm. then activate voice control. And so I will scroll through the document with my Apple pencil. I can highlight things. And then as I'm doing it, I can just dictate, I can say, you know, paragraph 1.2, I don't really like this term. We should make a you know recommendation to change it to this and that. So I can just kind of dictate as I go through. And so I'm reading the document, highlighting and talking to this dictation text file. And when I'm done, I'll go through and proof the text file. And then I'll send the text along with the highlighted PDF to the client so they can get my initial review. And that's, you know, that's not the final thing we're going to do on it, but that's my first take. And that method of doing it is so much faster than any way I ever did it before with pen and paper or just anything. And it's very, uh, it's just a, a great way to use dictation. Another thing I do is in the mornings, uh, when I'm going through OmniFocus in the morning, uh, there'll be a bunch of really small items in there, like send an email to Steven reminding him about his t-shirts or whatever. And so the stuff that I can do quickly, I'll have dictation running and I'll have a text file open. And this often happens on the Mac where I'll just go through OmniFocus and I will dictate the email to Steven. And then like if there's, I need to send a reminder to opposing counsel about something, I'll just I'll blast through all that stuff with my voice in the morning and I'll knock off like one third of the tasks for the day in like 15, 20 minutes with my voice. And then I've got that text file and I need to go and send them something you know, to turn some of them into emails and do different things with them. But it's just a super efficient way to, to blast through the nonsense and just using my voice for whatever reason, it goes faster and I actually do it. I'm not sure I do it with a keyboard. I'm not really sure why, but that's just hmm. me. Uh, thought pieces where I've got long letters, blog posts, legal writing stuff. I'll, I'll mind note plan them and I'll put my note on half the screen and then drafts or something on the other half and just start dictating through it. It's never like the final draft when I'm done, but it is a usable, lousy first draft, which, you know, at that point, the boulder is rolling downhill. Sounds good. I, I like that you're mixing and matching these things. And I think something like my node, which is an outlining utility, how that even that can play into writing and text creation because it's helping you structure your thoughts and what you want to do in a, a logical fashion. You can take that and then write from there in a more linear fashion. Yeah. Um, a couple other just general dictation tips. If this is new to you um, speak clearly, I mean, it's so obvious, but at the same time, it's hard. Uh, somebody told me once, talk like Walter Cronkite. And I'm sure there's some people listening to the show who've never heard of Walter Cronkite, but he used to be like the news anchor when there was only like one or two news anchors, but talk like a news anchor, you know, be very clear with your sentences. Uh, the biggest mistake you make when dictating is starting to dictate a sentence and not knowing where the sentence is going to end. You're better to just keep your mouth shut, compose the sentence in your mouth and then say it. Because when you give the dictation engine, the words, the contextual words around it, it does a much better job. If you have a bunch of gaps and pauses, it gets confused. Um, the uh, the classic example is ice cream, you know, the stuff you lick versus ice cream when I'm really mad. Um, uh, it doesn't know the difference unless you give it context. So getting it one sentence out at a time really helps. If you have a, a strange word, an app name, a name of a person, I use just animal names you know, like tiger, lion, you know, whatever. And I, I just put those in. And those are like variables to me at the end, I'll do a search and replace on them to get the right names in. And, uh, you know, it, that adds extra work, but that way I don't get a bunch of garbage in my dictation file. Do you have any tips on if you want to restart a sentence, maybe you're par partially through and want to change directions or restart it. Do you just go to a new line and start over and clean that up in the edit? Exactly. I just say new paragraph and I start the sentence okay. over again. And then you can always delete it in the edit. And, and there's ways to go back and like select it and replace it, but that's not as fast. It's just starting over again. I mean, assuming you have use of your hands and you can go through and do quick edits and you know your keyboard, you know, selection tools, you can you can fix a lot of that stuff really quickly. Mm -hmm. I would recommend trying it. If you're listening to this and you haven't done a lot of dictation, you know, you've got all the you just use the free tools on the Mac to start out with the Siri dictation. Download the 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 file on the Mac and just try it a couple times and take a little bit of intention to it. You can't just kind of like ramble on or it's gonna do a lousy job and you're not gonna like it. But if you can be, you know, deliberate with your dictation, you may find it's faster than typing. 
or just for whatever reason, just an easier way to get words in. I just find typing kind of a bore, you know, I'd rather be talking. <laughs> totally fair. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by FreshBooks. Online invoicing made easy. Go to freshbooks.com slash MPU to get started. Hey, freelancers, do you want to save 192 hours? Our friends at FreshBooks can help you do just that with their super simple cloud accounting software. By simplifying tasks like invoicing, tracking expenses, and getting paid online, FreshBooks has drastically reduced the time it takes for over 10 million people to deal with their paperwork. With FreshBooks, there's a whole lot to choose from. You can get set up and have it automate sending late payment email reminders so you can spend less time chasing payments and more time working your magic. With my FreshBooks account, I have that turned on. So if someone forgets to pay me, they get an automatic email reminder while I'm doing my work on other stuff. It's great. And also, when you email a client an invoice, FreshBooks can show you whether they've seen it, which puts an end to that guessing game as to whether they actually got the invoice or not. It's just a great way to manage this stuff. If you do any kind of work where you need to track your time or your expenses, FreshBooks is the best way to get paid. I love it. I'm a subscriber myself. If you're listening to this and not using FreshBooks yet, now's the time to try. FreshBooks is offering an unrestricted 30-day free trial for listeners of the show. There's no credit card required. And all you have to do is go to freshbooks.com slash MPU and enter Mac Power Users in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Me and Stephen would really appreciate that. We thank FreshBooks for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. So we wanted to wind down today talking about some text tools that make proofing and formatting pretty easy. You know, whether you've done some quick entry with the keyboard or you've dictated something, when it's time to, to sit down and clean it up and get it ready to go somewhere, there are a, a bunch of options. And the one we want to start about start with is Grammarly, which is this really like powerful and flexible grammar and spelling tool. It's a standalone Mac app, but it plugs into a bunch of stuff. There's an iOS version and I don't write in Grammarly, but any big article I write gets pushed through this before it gets published. Yeah. I was curious if you're a Grammarly subscriber or not. Yeah, I am too. Uh, I always thought those grammar tools were garbage. I remember when they first added them to like Microsoft Word and they would pester you with a bunch of, of grammar recommendations that were actually wrong. And, um, but Grammarly is the first one I ever bumped into that I'm like, oh, this is actually useful to me. And I've been a subscriber for several years. And like you, a lot of the material stuff I do goes through there. Although it's a little comma happy, I think. <laughs> it, it can be a little aggressive sometimes. Yeah, but the uh, but overall, I think if you do any amount of writing, this is a great tool. They so they do have a Mac app, but it's like it's just like a port of their. I think it's just running their their uh, their their uh, their web app in a in a in a wrapper. You can also use it on the web. They've got a web service. It plugs into Safari, so it can be running for anything you type in Safari. Uh, on iOS, they've got. A keyboard, which is kind of fun. So you can actually run the Grammarly proofing tools from a keyboard on your iPad, which is something I do. I, I think if you do a lot of writing, this is something worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's going to go out to the world. Yeah. Uh, Pop Clip is another text tool. Um, this is, uh, you know, the feature on iOS where you select text with your finger or your Apple Pencil, and it gives you a contextual menu of things you can do to it. Uh, Pop Clip is that but for the Mac. So whenever you select text with your mouse, it pops up a menu, but it's got a great plugin architecture. We've talked about this app on the show in years past, but it's been a long time since it came up and it still is in development and there's still a ton of things you can do to it. Some of my favorite plugins for it are title case. So if I want to apply title cases, I'm going to select it and pop clip automatically does it for me. It can also strip formatting. It can make things all caps or no caps. It, you know, there's just a whole bunch of text formatting stuff I do with Pop Clip, and I, I find it a really useful tool for that basic stuff. Uh, another one is Text Soap, which has also been around for for quite a while. It is a Mac app, and it can do so many, like so many things. Almost anything you could want to do, you could do it in Text Soap, and you can create groups and like what they call cleaner. So different formatting tools you want to send your text through. 
uh, it has its own text editor or you can bring text in from, from another program and it has Apple script support, which is really cool. And I mean, it can just, it can do so many things. You can do regex stuff. You can do things like title case. You can do live text matching. I mean, it goes on and on. It is a, it's kind of, it's almost like keyboard maestro, but just for text. Yeah, it's so awesome. It's one guy developing this app, and it's been his thing. It's his livelihood for all these years. And all he does is keep adding on more tools to it. Mm -hmm. And if you're a, a setup subscriber, you get this one for free because it's a, it's part of setup. And this is like a great kind of add-on app. And I use it probably about once every two weeks, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm always getting all kinds of weird text. And TechSoap is just such a great app for that. One thing people may not know is some of this stuff is available on the Mac directly. So if you select a bunch of text in a standard document, so you can't do this in Google Docs, for instance, but you can select and right click and choose transformations and it has uppercase, lowercase and capitalize. So not as fully featured as some of these programs, but if you just copy something from the web and it's stylized in all capital letters, you can right click and adjust it pretty easily. Again, if you're in a standard Mac app, so if you're in a web app or something like that, it may not be available. But if you're in Pages or ByWord or DevonThink or something like that, it should be available to you. I always wanted TechSoap for iOS. The developer has never done that, but there's an app called Text Case that I think is very close. And it gives you extensions, which are great for iOS to apply transformations to your, uh, to your text. It does uppercase, lowercase, smart quotes. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, I think that's really, to me, the tech soap of iOS. It is. There's also clean text, which is, again, similar to these things. You can put text in it and fix things like line breaks, paragraphs. There it has a cool one, replace tabs with spaces or spaces with tabs. So if you're copying code somewhere and you want to clean that up, it can do that. It can do a bunch with quotation marks, change them all to curvy quotes or straight quotes or whatever you're looking for. Yeah. And I think the other category of text-friendly apps is kind of the iOS clipboards, like uh, Copied and Yoink. And these are apps that like allow you to s have specific clipboards full of text. Uh, Copied is really more text-focused, and Yoink is kind of an overall shelf app. Mm -hmm. uh, although I have to admit, I use Yoink more than Copied, and I do put text on Yoink all the time. Yeah, but it can take images and links and other things as well. Yeah. Well, see, I uh, a little part of me was wondering if I did a show on text input that would be too light on material. <laughs> I don't think that was a problem today. No, this is this was great. I think this is uh, really useful showing how much of the stuff you can do on any device you have with you at any given time. Yeah, well, that's it, man. Uh, we're going to have a post for this show in the forums if you've got other ideas for getting text in quickly or, or ways to further automate than please let us know. We'd love to hear about it. As you now know, I have a magic draft that sends that, that feedback to the, uh, to the feedback outline. So that's all handled. Thanks to our sponsors today. That's our friends over at Sanebox, Kensington, Squarespace, and FreshBooks. We are the Mac Power users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. And Steven's over at 512 Pixels. Get one of his shirts. I'm going to get one. I'm going to go order it right now. And uh, see you all next week.